Welcome to On Earth As It Is In Heaven, brought to you each week with the support of the Eastern Orthodox Clergy Association of the Mahoning Valley and with the generous support of faithful listeners. It's our desire to expose orthodoxy to all who tune into this program and who speak of this experience to others. This is our effort at making small steps towards the salvation in the spiritual realm for all who listen. Here are your hosts for this week's edition of On Earth As It Is In Heaven. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Well, I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Well, I was going to say I'm doing good, but then I'd be a, make myself a liar. Well, we're in, why? Because I'm not good. W- why aren't you good? Because I'm not God. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There's only one that's good. Yeah, that's right. No yeah. one is good. And I am only not one. And I am not him. No, that's true. I am not him. I'm, I'm <clears throat> glad you realized that. Is that just something you realized this week? Yes. Oh. I, you know, I have finally acquired all of the humility. Oh, my yeah. goodness. So just, <laughs> you, are, you are just full of yourself with the humility. I'm I like, know. Just, Come receive some. I cannot some. believe it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm the king of humility now. Ah, <laughs> ah, oh, oh, No. Mm. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> George and I are back on the show. Yeah. We're uh, we're going now. We're in, into the eve of Pentecost. We celebrate starting our celebrations tonight uh, with Great Vespers, and we have uh, lots of Old Testament readings. And then tomorrow we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost uh, with uh, with lots of celebration of services, and then um, blessing of fishing poles mm-hmm. and fish nets. And then uh, and if so, if you don't bring your fishing poles and your fish nets, I really hope that you have a terrible fishing season. I mean, because like wow. I mean, seriously, wow. how could you not bring your fishing how pole is, to the Feast of Pentecost, that? right? That's so hardcore, Father. Well, do you feel offended? Well, not yet. I haven't <laughs> not brought my fishing pole yet. <laughs> but when I don't remember to bring it, I'm going to be really upset with yeah. you. Well, it's not me who forgot. It's you're the one that forgot. No, with, with you wishing bad fish on me. Yeah, this is true. I mean, fish can like three eyes, you know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You on know, porpoise? On poipus. Yeah, Gary said he said that on porpoise. Yeah. So, yeah, so we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Um, and then also after we do all that, right after all that, we, we take a break. And uh, then we have what's called kneeling, kneeling Vespers tomorrow, um, which is spread throughout all of Orthodoxy. Everybody does this. All the Orthodox, this is part of our tradition. And we have kneeling Vespers to bring back now uh, what's called now prostrations. And now kneeling into our own prayer life because we've been celebrating, right? Because Pascha happened. Yes. We've been celebrating for these last 50 days, rejoicing. And then now Pentecost descends upon the tongues of fire. Mm, but for the non-Orthodox out there, what is the significance of uh, what are prostrations and what's the significance of not doing them in this period? Well, if you were just patient, I would tell you. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I'm not God and I didn't know you were going there. Well, how dare you? You're not clairvoyant yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> So, um, so then we do kneeling vespers, which is a beautiful service where we are kneeling. We're asking for God's forgiveness, and we get back into this ascetical kind of routine, right? Because we've been rejoicing, celebrating Paschal Tide, the Easter Tide time. Uh, now, the significance of prostrations is not just a holy burpee. You know, uh, there's this kind of mentality of um, of kind of having that in the back of your mind, like I'm doing a workout. Um, prostrations are meant to destroy the body and to wake up the soul, to warm up the body, to wake up the soul. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, <clears throat> it's also part of our ascetical life because the more that we tire out our body, the more that we actually fall, uh, we, we fall less into sin right? because we're so exhausted. Mm-hmm. This has always been a tradition passed down to us um, from the early, early, early times of uh, you look at the apostles. I mean, look at our Lord. I mean, our Lord took naps, right? He, he rested because he was constantly exerting the body to show us that this is how we're supposed to live, right? Uh, this is why uh, we need to use our time wisely on this earth because if we use it and waste our time, you know, I see a lot of this, you know, wherever you go, you know, people are constantly just on their phones uh, and, and what a waste of time just staring at a screen all day, 24-7, and yet you're not, you're not even thinking about God. Well, that's true. You know? And so prostrations, well, 
prostrations exert the body so that way you can not focus on the self and focus on God. Does that make sense? Is that what we teach? Yes. Then it makes perfect sense. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure it makes sense okay. to you. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it takes a lot. Prostrations are, uh, um, for those of you who weren't in the military, if you don't know what a burpee is, it's a push up. But uh, in prostrations, you go all the way flush with the floor, horizontal to the floor. And, uh, and and you can do it as a as a push up is done and get back up and get down and do it that way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it's yeah. not an exercise thing. Yeah. It's, you know, it's yeah, it's however you get down and prostrate yourself yeah. before God. Yeah, you fall down and you get back up. You know, and so <laughs> it's I, sort of representative of our lives of sin. Well, and that's the other thing yeah. too is that it also represents uh, our our life, right? The resurrectional life, right? Because you fall, because <clears throat> you fall when you fall in the mm-hmm. sin. And then you get back up and live, try to re- live that resurrected life. Mm-hmm. And then you do it again. Yeah. And you know, so on and so forth. And so I always tell people who are first getting into a prayer life um, and falling into this um, uh, that I tell them to just start off with just three mm-hmm. really small. Mm-hmm. Because your body does have to get used to it in a physical oh, yeah. aspect. Yeah. You do have to get used to it. You do have to build up strength, of course, and so on and so forth. Um, but I really encourage people just to start off three. Um, if you read the Gospels uh, everywhere, people are falling down and prostrating and worshiping mm-hmm. our Lord. Yes. Right? Like, and you look at the scene in the, in, in when they're on, on the boat and the storms are raging and, and so on and so forth. And then our Lord calms the seas and then they fall down and show adoration, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, worship. So, yes, yeah, so we bring that, we start that tonight. <clears throat> and then we also, as Orthodox, we bring in this beautiful prayer. It's called the prayer of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's said it uh, almost at every beginning of every service and of your prayer life where uh, the prayer goes, O heavenly King, the comforter, the spirit of truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good one. Mm-hmm. So we start saying that prayer tonight after Vespers, tomorrow morning, <clears throat> Uh, for Orthodox, you'll hear your priest say that in the beginning of the Divine Liturgy for the first time in over 50 days. So um, it's quite a joy for us. You know, Pentecost <clears throat> is in the Old Testament. You know, this thing isn't just like made up. You know, it's kind of like, oh, uh, I guess Christians just make up their own feast days. But if you go to Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23 talks about what's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Uh, this was uh, Pentecost. Because it was after 50 days after the atonement. Uh, and so uh, that's, if you'd like to learn more, more about that in the Old Testament, I, I want to point you to Leviticus uh, chapter 23. So for those who are interested. Mm-hmm. And today our focus is going to be on, on John's gospel, chapter 7, uh, verses 37 to uh, 50, 52 which is the end of, of John's gospel in chapter seven. Yeah. And then only one verse in chapter eight, verse 12. And so this is the gospel that we're reading tomorrow and uh, going to be focusing on. We're also in the epistle. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter two, verses one to 11, when the apostles are waiting in the upper room mm-hmm. and then the Holy Spirit descends upon them. So uh, let's, let's get to John's gospel and then we'll just focus on that. So here we go. John, yeah. Chapter 7, verse 37. If you have the full Orthodox study Bible, page 1438. Thank you. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 37 to 52, and then chapter 8, verse 12. So on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit with which those who believed in him were to receive for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there is the vision among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then went back to the chief priest and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered him, are you led astray? You also have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd who do not know the law are accursed. Nicodemus who had gone to them, gone to him before and was the one of them and was one of them 
said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and you will see that no prophet is to rise from Galilee. And again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that was a 12, that last phrase. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, it's so good with you, Father. Probably a lot of people don't know what the Feast of Tabernacles is. I could read the note on that. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Hebrew, Sukkoth, okay, is an eight-day autumn harvest festival commemorating the time when Israel wandered in the wilderness of Sinai and the people lived in tents or tabernacles. Along with Passover and Pentecost, this was one of the three most important festivals of the ancient Jews. It included numerous sacrifices and celebrations, you will read as Father told you in Leviticus 23. In later times, the final days of this feast also included drawing water from the pool of Siloam to be mixed with wine and poured at the foot of the altar, both as a purification and in remembrance of the water flowing from the rock that Moses struck in Exodus 17 verses 1 through 7. It further included the lightning of great the lighting of great lamps in the outer court of the temple. So that's what it's about. Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting. If you were to read the beginning of chapter 7, so if you read from verses 1 to 36, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it'd be good for those who are listening to go ahead and read that privately. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The beginning of chapter 7, uh, our Lord's brethren <clears throat> who have come up to him saying, are you coming to the feast in Jerusalem? And he says, no, not yet. I'll, I'll, I will. I'm going to, my time has not yet come. I'm going to wait. And then he comes a little bit later uh, and he's kind of, our Lord is kind of hiding back in, into the temple, uh, hasn't revealed himself yet in this dialogue, which, which is what 37 is. He's kind of the end of the dialogue that he's been having with them. And he's kind of, kind of putting, <laughs> kind of telling them, you know, you're kind of, you're wrong. You know, you guys are wrong. I mean, what everything you're doing in here is just, you're not following what Moses is talking about. This is why at the end of chapter seven, the, the, uh, the officers come, come back. Because the people are confused. Is this really the Christ? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, he heals on the Sabbath, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so I'd encourage people to read chapter seven, verses one to 36 to kind of get the end, end of this. But I really kind of want to focus on, on the living waters. You know, the beginning of this in, in verses 37 to 39, he's, he's, this is the end of his teaching. Uh, and this in this chapter and he says if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink and he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water which is from isaiah 44 mm. um and isaiah 44 it talks about i will pour out my spirit upon you and i will give you the living waters which is kind of amazing because uh, when we acquire the gifts of the holy spirit through a life of asceticism, right prostrations, we mm -hmm. talked about in the beginning, a life of asceticism, a life of humility, a life of true love for God, your heart does become a living water. And people will become attracted to that. People will run to you. It's like, it's like I've said this before, whenever you meet a holy person, you don't want to leave them. Just being around them, just being around their presence is good enough for you. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, that's been my experience when I'm around people that are holy. And this is the same with our Lord. This is why people are constantly around him. Mm -hmm. And it's also why uh, it, the meek uh, are the ones who go to him, right? The ones who are, we talked about in our Wednesday night Bible study. It's really the, if you want to use our modern terms, the handicapped who are so humble and listen and are surrounding him. Mm -hmm. But the proud, right? The Pharisees, um, I mean, I mean, they're very ignorant. Go oh, search yeah. the scriptures to go see if anyone has come out of Galilee. We have five prophets that came out of Galilee. Yeah, one of them I was just reading here as you were speaking was, uh, well, actually the prophet Jonah came Jonah. from Galilee. I didn't know that yeah. until today. Yeah. Jonah came out of Galilee. Elijah, you know, so this idea that no one came, came out of Galilee, they're very ignorant of the scriptures. So they... <clears throat> well, they're just blatantly being false. Yeah. Because they don't want him to be the Messiah. Yeah. I mean, it's a false narrative. Yeah. Would you like to explain more on that? I can't. It's a lie. That's all I can say about it. I mean, they they have much to lose. 
Yeah. We know that. They have aligned themselves with the power of Rome. Mm. Uh, they are successful because of the power of Rome. Um, I wasn't there, but if I was them, I think I probably would be lying to myself that God was blessing us with uh, all that we have and that we would ultimately overcome Rome through God's blessing. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're looking for a king to lead them to victory and, uh, and to cast Rome out. But they don't realize that Rome's in their heart. And that's what Christ is there to cast out, mm -hmm. is that worldliness. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you have anything else in your heart, you hate God. And that's exactly what the Pharisees, they, they do not love God. And if you do not love God, then therefore you hate God. Yeah, but they don't know that. They don't know that. Because we're very good at blinding ourselves to our own uh, uh, abominations. Yeah. 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 And so they lack the rivers of, of, of the Holy Spirit, of the living water, right, that, that Christ is trying to show them. Um, now, this he said about the Spirit, verse 39, which those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Uh, this is, of course, uh, preparing us before you get further into John's gospel. When you get to John's gospel, chapter 13 uh, through 17, uh, I'm sorry, John's from 13 to 16, um, you understand what he's saying now because he tell, he, he's constantly telling the, the disciples in those three, those three chapters, I'm going to send you the comforter. And if you knew who he was, you'd be exceedingly glad and you wouldn't be upset because they keep asking, where is he going? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is he going out to someone else? You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and so. Uh, well, didn't they said to him, they said, well, uh, they wanted to go with him. He said, can you, what were his words exactly, Father? Can you bear, I have to paraphrase, can you bear that which I'm about to bear? Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, yes, we can. And he said, and, and certainly you will. Yeah. Yeah, that's in Matthew's gospel when yeah, he James, prophesied their martyr. James and John come up to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. And so when they heard these words, verse forty, some of the people said, "This is really the prophet." Others said, "This is the Christ." But some said, "Is Christ to come from Galilee?" Um, Father, you know, can you expound on that a little bit? What is this? The difference? I, I know the difference between a prophet and Christ, but why are they making that distinction of prophet and Christ? What are they expecting from a prophet? The last of the prophets before the Messiah, maybe? Yeah. Is that it? Okay. Okay. That's part of it. That's yeah. not all of it. That's not all of it. I'm I'm trying to pray to make sure that I have. Give that you the, says it the refers right to the expected Messiah, the Savior Moses foretold would come. A lot of times when we see that, because this is constantly, hmm. this is common throughout the Gospels, when the people are saying, you know, is this the prophet or is this the Christ? And it happens a lot. Um, there's at least two or three other accounts where that happens. Uh, a lot of times they're confusing the word the prophet and the Christ. They're using the meaning the same thing, you mean? Yes. Yeah, and there's something, I'll look it up while you talk, Father, in Deuteronomy 18. I'm going to see if that gives any clarification to it. I believe that's just Moses telling the people that he's going to be the prophet, but the prophet coming after him, which is the Christ, Okay. right? Um, so there's that. I think there's a lot of confusion how they're they're interchanging it, right? Is this the prophet, right? Is this the Christ? Yeah, it's you know? interesting the way it's presented. It's almost like... The prophet would be less than the Messiah in the way it. It, it could comes be. Across. I don't. I don't really have the exact answer on that. Uh, mm -hmm. I do know that. I, f I. I know that in a few commentaries they do talk about how um, it means the same thing, and they're just they're just interchanging the words. Because remember, in in Hebrew, right? You know, Christ is the Anointed One, mm -hmm. which kings and prophets were anointed. Okay, I have it, and it's not very long. Go ahead. Okay, this is Deuteronomy eighteen fifteen through 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired in the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. Mm. That really does sound like this is the one yeah not there's nothing more beyond this and the lord said to me what they have spoken is good i will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren 
and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So they're interchanging the word. Yeah, looks like. They're just yeah. using it. So um, I think with this too, you know, you, you just read the prophecy, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, which you think the Pharisees who were so fluent in scripture would understand that because Christ tells them all the time, I, I can't do anything contrary to the father. I must do what he do- mm-hmm, tells me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it, it's astounding that the, that the Pharisees um, will, they look at Galilee uh, at one point in the scriptures, it has anything good come out of Nazareth? And it's like, does anybody get it that he was born in Bethlehem? How could they not have any knowledge of that at all? Nobody was going to question where did this man come from? Where was he born? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's just really interesting to me that we don't find in the scriptures that they acknowledge that he was born in Bethlehem. Mm-hmm. So therefore, the Messiah came out of Bethlehem. Maybe they thought he had to walk out of Bethlehem as a grown individual ready to command and cast out Rome. Yeah. Yeah, is probably what they're thinking. Well, yeah. I mean, that's part of it. And remember, there's that other prophecy too. You know, this was foretold to go to Bethlehem, so that's in Micah. uh, 5-2. 5-2. It's also in... um, Because in the Old Testament, it's not used as Bethlehem. It's used as Ephrathah. Mm-hmm. Remember that Ephrathah is what is the Old Testament town name for Bethlehem. You know, I didn't know that. So I'm just learning that today. So whenever Thank you, you whenever you see Ephrathah, because Ephrathah comes up several times, mm-hmm. I, I just can't think of it right now. But Ephrathah, in the Psalms, it comes up, <clears throat> comes up especially a lot. during Lent when we're doing the pre-sanctified. Mm-hmm. Ephrathah is one of the mentioned in those. In those, it's, it's called the Psalms of the Ascent, which is from mm-hmm. Psalm Psalms 119 or 120 if you have the Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. 119, 120 to one. Uh, uh, 33, I believe it is. Okay. So it's a, it's about a dozen or so psalms mm-hmm. called the Psalms of Ascent, um, and uh, I think it's Psalm 32 or 31. I don't remember which one it is. Or 29. I can't remember. It's right there. One of those three um, where it talks about the House of Ephrathah and so on and so forth. So uh, you know, Ephrathah is, is a big part of this, um, and you know, so this is foretold in some of the prophets that the Christ or the prophet is to come out of Ephrathah, Bethlehem, but also out of Egypt, I've called my firstborn, my son. Yes, which is uh, the return from the flight of Egypt. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, they have to understand that too. I mean, he came out of Egypt. He fled to Egypt, you know, but they go to Nazareth. Remember, they go to, they go to Nazareth to be uh, for the census. I have a question sure. for you. Go ahead. How old was Christ when he was called back out of Egypt? So uh, tradition tells us, right? Because this isn't in scripture. Yes. But tradition tells us that he's he's in Bethlehem until he's about two, and then yeah. and then leaves to go into Egypt. Egypt, right? This is why uh, Herod kills those who are two and under, mm-hmm. right? Then there's the the slaughtering of the infant child. Not children. because he left, but because he was trying to kill him, and the flight mm-hmm. to Egypt was the direction of God through the angel for mm-hmm. him. For the family to, to run in Egypt, up, to, yes. as he told Joseph. Yes. They're in Egypt. Um, I would say for what I've read uh, just for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And so that he comes back to Nazareth, I would say probably uh, in, anywhere from the ages of, of six and eight. Okay. And Joseph is still alive then, tradition tells us. He doesn't uh, depart, uh, repose until our Lord is a, is a teenager to a young man. Because mm-hmm. there's no written documents on this. So, I mean, we can't give a definite, definite answer to that. Right. And... Uh... Can I branch out for a moment? Sure. Uh, th- something came up today in uh, going over uh, Noetic Covenant, mm-hmm. okay? And there are things in the Noetic Covenant that are stated in the Scriptures that have no precedent in Scripture. Oh. So they had to have the, the concept of sacrifice, is not really laid out as to what that's all about until you get to Moses, who wrote uh, the the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Scripture. But uh, it was interesting that some of the men were having difficulty because here it talks about, and they knew Scripture well enough to know that there was no definition of sacrifice and the explanation of what this is all about 
un, until Moses. These for so how then did he know what to do? Became the question, and it was like, well, it would have to have been tradition. <laughs> well, that too, tradition. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at. Luke's gospel real quick, chapter two, verses 41, where they're back in Jerusalem and he's 12 years old. So between the age of, uh, of two and 12, you know, he could have been in Egypt, mm -hmm. you know, or two and 11, sorry, yeah. two and 11. So yeah. there's that tradition, however long he was in Egypt and then goes back to Nazareth. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, the, this noetic connection. And I would say to people that, you know, how did Moses learn how to do sacrifices and so on and so forth? I would definitely say, well, yeah, there's this tradition, but also too, or how did Abraham know how to do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there had to have been a tradition. Well, and but also it, too, and also too, I would also state that, and we know that they did because uh, he sat, was sacrificing his son. Yeah, and then the and mm. then the Lord supplied him with the ram. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, you're right. And there's also uh, what, what do you think Moses was doing on top of Mount Sinai when he's writing all this down? Or not not him. Our Lord's writing it. Mm -hmm. The finger of God is writing in stone. This is why Moses, he's so furious when he comes back down from Mount Sinai and Joshua and Aaron, you know, well, the people have, you know, worshiped the calf now and he throws down those stones. Um, so, I mean, our Lord is also showing him the proper way. This is why there's the book of Le Leviticus mm -hmm. where it tells how the priests are to do all of these things. Yeah, it's interesting. They needed the law. We need the law. The law if I understand the scripture correctly, the law actually exists in us. We know what is good and we know what is not good. We have conscience, which is given to us. But we need the law in order to... Um, it's almost like we don't want to take responsibility for knowing what is good and what is not good. And so the law defines for us. And that never really works out very well, as we see in the scripture. Uh, ultimately, we become a bunch of... Uh, jurists and uh, and 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 we uh check off things and think we're okay by checking them off as opposed to living them yeah uh, you make a really good point i i think i think you know when we read the law and read the old testament there's unfortunately this uh, and it really is a dirty habit where we start blaming god for you know how could he do all these atrocities i mean yeah joshua is killing all these people so on and so we get oh, extremely emotional about it you know this isn't a god that i worship uh, well when you start looking at it from uh, the spiritual aspect of it you know there was it was a land that needed to be cleansed but when you look at the law when you look at the law <clears throat> it's actually called to make our heart soft and that's what the pharisees don't get yeah they don't like have they a soft heart hard. <laughs> yeah because you they read it in a um a manner in which Oh, they just read it in a, in a, in a non-spiritual way. What I mean by that is that when you read the law, when you read you know Genesis to Deuteronomy, um, you read in there, you know, take the traveler and care for him. Wash his feet. Mm -hmm. And then you understand why our Lord is washing the feet of the apostles. He's doing the law. Because aren't we sojourners and travelers in this world? God sure. isn't. God isn't a sojourner. You know, and, and so when you read the law or it's called this, you know, even when it talks about, you know, if you see your enemy, your enemy's uh, ox, you know, in a ditch, you're called to take it out of the ditch and bring it back to your enemy. Yeah. I mean, isn't that called to make our hearts soft? Because if you don't like somebody and you see something that's, that's broken or whatever, you know, belongs to them, you should return it back to them. So, I mean, the law was called to make their hearts soft and ready and prepared for the Messiah. Yeah, it was something to prepare us. It was the next step in our growth uh, spiritually. Yeah. And, and it became, again, non-spiritual. Yeah. We again turned to that which is not of God. Well, they became, you know, there's that idea, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Well, it's the other way with the Pharisees. They were religious, but not spiritual. Mm, yeah, I get it. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so, uh, I mean, they really fall into this. I mean, they, they don't have soft hearts. I mean, this is why... When we read the Pharisees, a lot of times, you know, we should see ourselves as them because we are constantly contradicting God, right? Is this the Christ? Is this God really performing a miracle on me or so on and so forth? You know, is God really giving me all this wonderful things? And then we forget to glorify him. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Uh, God is not our, uh, not to be seen as our, uh, uh, 
I can't think of it how it's quite said. What it breaks down into is, I'm in trouble, God help me. Yeah. I'm not in trouble, wait until I'm in trouble again and I'll talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it becomes a transactional relationship. Mm-hmm. And it, not only is it transactional, it's a cheap transactional mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, we kind of see ourselves, I mean, this is how we should we should be learning to read scriptures not through our own earthly eyes, but learn to read it through uh, the heavenly eyes. But well, that I, takes time and it takes patience and it's not going to just come all of a sudden. Just like everything in, in the spiritual world, yeah. in the spiritual life, it doesn't just happen overnight. Uh, I agree, Father. And uh, the the things that I've read in the Fathers and have been taught by the good priests that I have known in my life in the Church is that reading the Psalms is yeah. a tremendous help in uh, ultimately growing spiritually, yeah. learning actually how to pray, and coming to understanding in the Scriptures. Yeah. Um, it opens you to those things. It's not a formula, but it is... Uh, it is a gateway through which there's a lot of growth available. Yeah, the Psalter, you know, I really recommend to the people to 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 read the Psalms a lot, especially with certain with certain sins that really attack them. Um, the Psalms are truly incredible because if you look at the Mystical Supper, for those who don't know what I mean by Mystical Supper, also known as the Last Supper mm-hmm. in Western terms, but it's not the Last Supper; it's the Mystical Supper. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do they do after they sing Psalms and mm-hmm. hymns? The liturgical worship of of our spiritual ancestors and the, of the Jews was a based around the Psalter. Um, Let us go up because it's now the hour. Yeah, and they would go up for prayer at given hours, and those prayers included Psalms. Yeah, and they and they recited the Psalms. Yeah. constantly they memorized them. In fact, in the church, in order for somebody to become a bishop, this was one of the canons that a bishop had to recite the whole Psalter. Yeah, and that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And um. I really encourage the Psalter to people. Uh, I always, I, so I encourage them in the spiritual life. You know, I always tell, before I go into that real quick, I tell people this quite often. You can get pretty far in your spiritual life with just your Bible and your prayer rope. Yes. You can get very, very far. Mm-hmm. In fact, far, farther than I would say a lot of people. Um, and I encourage them to really just consume as much scripture as they can of starting with the new Testament, right? So Matthew all the way to revelation. Even if you can only do a verse a day, if that's all you can handle, start with that, but really try doing a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening, and then do a few Psalms in your prayer and the prayer rule. So if you're, for instance, morning, morning prayer with morning prayer, <clears throat> it's great to just pray the Psalms and then pray the, the Jesus prayer on your prayer rope for a while. It, does, it doesn't have to be long. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you start off small with well, you know, prostrations, and yeah. you add the prostrations into it. You know, go ahead, George. All right, uh, you know, uh, for those of you out there who are who would like to do this and go, well, geez, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Um, you could get an Orthodox Study Bible, which has the prayers in the back. You could also, if you want, you could text me, and I can send you a link to Greek or. Orch- archdiocese, which are brief prayers for the hours of the day and vespers and matins, but not the full course, okay? Because yeah, the, so, the full course should be at church. Yes. Yeah. And um, and so you would be able to uh, be able to read one or two psalms at a time. Most of them are a single psalm. Yeah. And then there's a short prayer, and then there's the closing prayer, and it doesn't take but a moment. Yeah. And you could begin your prayer life in that way if you want to do that. My number's 330-207-3672. Text me uh, prayers, the word prayers, and I will send back to you um, a link. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and there's no, uh, you know, there won't be any other f- contact unless you say you want more contact. Well, yeah, and I would you know, also add, to you. I would also add that to truly learn how to pray is to become Orthodox. Um, I'm probably going to fluff feathers, but that's okay. That's a good thing. That's what well, I, you're a convert, that's Father. That's what I do. People should know that you converted to Orthodoxy well, yeah. because uh, you prayed, certainly, uh, and it a led lot me, and, and it led sincerely. Me, and, it led me, and it led me to Orthodoxy, but... Um, I was not praying with a sincere, a sincere and humble heart. But you didn't and, know that. But I didn't know that. And it wasn't until I journeyed into orthodoxy that it showed me that. 
and how I was to do that. And uh, through having a spiritual father and through uh, reading the lives of the saints and reading of scripture over and over and over again, and they keep reading and uh, not just reading, but uh, the experience of my own personal prayer life, you know, and in order to get better at prayer is to just keep doing it and asking God to lead you. I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly in my past, it led me to where I am now. And thanks be to God, but I still have lots of work to do. And I still have lots of training to go through and everything and yeah. so, and so forth. But, but my point is that you're really truly never going to understand the Psalms and scripture unless you go into orthodoxy. And I mean that because, uh, and first of all, one, I mean, historically, yeah, okay. We can use the historical account, right? Orthodoxy gave the world the Bible. Got it. Boom. We understand that. Two, um, it is through the lenses of how St. Paul goes up into the third heaven, which is passed down to us through the teachings of Hezekiah and the theosis and trying and striving to see the uncreated light. Well, I think that's a lot for people to digest, especially if they have not been uh, a part of orthodoxy. And also, I think it's a lot to digest for people, uh, even people who are orthodox. It all depends on how much they, we, not they, because I'm part of them, how much we commit ourselves to uh, living the life ascetically and a life of prayer, and in growing in that, and accepting the reality of that, is very hard. I was talking to someone today about uh, living in the in the world as uh, as we meet our needs. In the world, we seem to add needs, mm. and as uh, as we add more needs, we begin to move further and further away from what is truly essential, which is prayer liturgical life, sacramental life, and until we finally harden ourselves and uh, we just don't really believe anymore. And so I think it's very hard, Father. I think it, it, it's a lot. Of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. It was a lot for the apostles. Yeah. It was a lot for everyone else, and it's always a lot for me, too. I mean, yeah, I mean, I get tired, too. I mean, I get tired when it's a long liturgical day and we have a lot going on. I, mm -hmm. get, I, get, I get tired, but... I know that I have to endure in order for my, my, I mean, I have to stretch. Well, yeah, but isn't that too. something so, someone learns? They yeah, learn through guidance, learn. through uh, the, the church, the scriptures, the spiritual father that they have. Uh, it, you know, it's, uh, a spiritual father's not like a yogi or a, um, a, a, a guru. Yeah, okay. I was going to say a shaman. Yeah, He's not a, a shaman. shaman. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really quite an interesting relationship, and I don't know that it can be well-defined uh, oh, 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 through our talk on the radio, but it's a very different relationship. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Very, it's a very close relationship. Yeah. It's not a in-awe discipleship of somebody no. who is so elevated. And it should never be that you. way. Yeah. I mean, we read the Desert yeah. Fathers, uh, they never ever speak that way of each other. No. You read the Saints, they never speak that way of each other. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, the one we should be striving, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to pause right there on spiritual fatherhood. It's it's a lot to go into right now. Yeah. It's something where I think we should probably t spend some time Maybe on do it. do a show on it. Do on a show on it and spend some yeah. time on it. Uh, but, you know, uh, but you're, you're really truly never going to learn how to pray unless you journey into orthodoxy. And that hurts people because there's a reason why... Um, many Protestants, uh, especially, fall into yoga. You just talked about yoga, yogi. Yeah, they yeah. fall into yoga practices um, because there's no spiritual nourishment even involved. It's just you know be there on Sundays and read your Bible and that's it. Yeah, <clears throat> and that won't just feed the soul. Uh, you know, there's also this mentality of there's kind of cultish practices in other religions, kind of like what George said, like the shaman guru. That guru basically becomes your god. Yeah, you know, and that that's that's even in Protestantism, Protestantism and 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 Roman Catholicism too. You see that a lot. Of well, this person is you know so highly elevated, elevated that I'm going to quote him all the time. Well, why not quote Christ? Well, anybody's you know? subject to that weakness. I mean, yeah. I, there are people that in happens. Orthodoxy who, that can do this, who do the same thing. Yeah, but I think that the, for me, yeah. what I have found in Orthodoxy is um, it, it's a narrow way. Yet, the teachings offer a great many paths as to how to st to stay on that narrow way. Well, and especially yeah. when you look at the lives of the saints, yeah. which are us, they are our spiritual family, they're our family, 
uh, all of them have lived lives that are pretty similar to ours. Yeah. And there's no one spiritual saint for everybody. Oh, I know. Okay, though yeah. all the saints are for everyone. Yeah. And and so Well, there's it, also spiritual connection to different saints. You yeah. know, for for me, you know, I've I've really learned a journey close to um to Saint Mark, our patron, oh, for many reasons. One, he's our patron. We should strive to be close to him. Uh, two, he has performed miracles in my life. Uh I think I I think I want to tell a story real quick. Okay, go ahead. Um it's kind of urging me. Uh, St. Mark is incredible. I, I've really gotten, gotten close with him. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we, uh, you know, Fridays are my day off, right? And so I, I went hiking with one of our good friends. Uh, he's a priest mm -hmm. out in central PA, or not central PA, in, a in Akron. And we went hiking all together. Him, his family, he has little ones and I have little ones. And we had, we're having a great time. But their little son, um, he took a big um, dive off the playground and hurt himself after we were done hiking. We were hiking and then he went, they went to the yeah. playground <clears throat> and he gashed himself pretty hard on the head. I mean, it was extreme bleeding. It was, uh, it was like emergency, emergency room, room stuff. stuff. Yeah. It was pretty bad. And uh, luckily my wife is a nurse and the mom was also a nurse, but she was f f kind of traumatized with her son. And so my wife being, went in nurse mode, you know, was quickly bringing him over to the, to the table. I grabbed the kids. They bring him next to me, and um, thanks be to God that a police officer was rolling around just checking on the park and the, and the hiking trails. Uh, and I started praying there, and now because everybody was kind of, everybody was really, I mean, they're emotional. They were just really upset, sure. you know? And so I immediately started, started praying to St. Mark, and I, 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 um, I said, Holy St. Mark, please help. We don't know what to do. Please help the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. Please, St. Mark, please help us. Uh, and um, immediately his head stopped bleeding. The bruise started going down. And so the police officer comes over. My wife calls the police officer. There's barely any blood to wipe up now. Hmm. I mean, his whole face Praise God. was covered in blood. And hmm. I thought in that moment, I mean, this is what we're called to do. I mean, I, first of all, I was shocked that this is even happening. And, and I think sometimes we forget about the intercessions of the saints no matter who they may be in the Orthodox Church. You know, sometimes there's this mentality of, well, they're this saint, so I can't really talk to them. It's like, well, no, any of the saints uh, can perform miracles in our lives, just like we're called to perform that life. And um, when that happened, uh, I have grown even closer to St. Mark, and I constantly talk to him. Because he's leading me closer to Christ. Why would I not want to talk to him and be around him? Well, you know? it's, a, it's a fair statement, isn't it, Father, that when we speak to the saints, we are speaking to Christ. Yeah. And some would say, well, then you don't need to speak to them. And it's like, nah, you don't, you don't get, get it. it. No. <laughs> you don't get it. Uh, no. It's, it's not a, you know, they, they gave up their lives for Christ. I don't just mean in martyrdom. I mean in everyday living. Well, that's the in all that they life. did. I mean, that's yeah. the ascetical life. I mean, that's why we're talking about prostrations at the beginning, yeah. that you're killing the body so that the soul may soar higher to God. It's like saying, well, then uh, Christ comes into the world through his saints. Yeah. He comes into the world through them. It, we're supposed to be that yeah. in life. Christ is supposed to come into the world through us. People should see Christ in us. Yeah. And, and that's not something that we do ourselves, right? Well, no, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, and also, too, you know, everything that we talk about here, you know, today we're talking about, uh, we're really talking about ascetical life yeah. in this gospel, so that way we can become uh, rivers of living water. Uh, we're all receiving this from, from the saints, you know, I mean, like what George, what, you know, we were just talking about the Psalms. Yeah. You know, the Psalms, uh, this is not, you know, George and Father Collins, you know, advice. This is handed down to us for over however long the Psalm, how long ago the Psalms are written, over 3,000 years ago or whatever. And, and uh, how the saints have used them. I mean, Christ uses them. He's constantly quoting the Psalms. Then you read the epistles. <laughs> the epistles are over. Uh, hold on. The, the epistles are uh, over flooded with the Psalter. Um, and then when you look at the liturgical life, they're over flooded with the Psalter. So I mean, the Psalms, if they're so, if they're being used by all of these holy men and women, why then wouldn't we want to use them in our own spiritual life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The saints 
are the epitome of Christ's statement. Let them be one, Father, as you and I are one. Let them be one in uh, in us. Yeah. Yes. So, And that's why it's hard for people. Yes. Right? That's why it's hard because they got to go, oh, my goodness, I must die to the world. Yes. That means I can no longer. I'm getting excited. No, no, no it's I, okay. I, I can no longer. It means I, I have to. I have to destroy the, the worldly pleasures it means I can't be attracted to them. Yeah, that's exactly what that means. So if something leads you into sin, you must kill that. Yeah, but I, I, would, I wouldn't say I can't be attracted to them. It means I won't be yes. attracted to them. Yeah. There's an act of will. Yeah. There's an act of will. God doesn't prohibit me. In, he prohibits me from participating in those things in the world which keep me from God by saying to me, this is not good for you. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt mm-hmm. not covet, etc., and so mm-hmm. on. But he doesn't make me do it. Yeah. It's an act of will. It's what I will not do yeah. that defines that. And so if, if the saints are living, let them be one, Father, as you and I are one, then if we don't believe that if I'm inter- asking a saint to intercede for me, that I am speaking to Christ, then how can I believe that Christ is himself talking to the Father, that he himself is God? Let them be Father in me as I am in you. It, well, and also to holy the, mackerel. Well, and also the saints are living water. And, um, and I would encourage people to, you know, I tell all the people all the time at our parish, you know, constantly talk to St. Mark. Constantly talk to him. Find a saint that uh, that you really have a spiritual connection to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for many people that takes a lot of vulnerability, right? Because I mean, wait, that means I have to talk to somebody. Yes, you have to talk to somebody. You can't text them. You know, yeah. like you can't just text the saints. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you have to physically call out their name. They're Holy- working on an app for that. Oh, they are. Yeah. I wonder what it's going to be called. Um, text the saint. How to fail spiritually? I think. <laughs> I would call it text the saint, you know, <laughs> saint text, you know, saint text. you know, but I think, I, I, you know, you have to do it. You have to say it just like you have to say the Psalms, just like you have to fall down on your face to do prostration, just like you have to physically get in the car and, and come to church and receive Holy Communion. Just as, just like you have to physically give up your own will to be in align with God's Holy will. And yeah, that's scary and that's overwhelming. And, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes we think, oh man, how am I ever going to do that? Well, little by little one, little by little, that's how you're going to do it. Start off with just focusing on right now. You know, I, I you know, for Americans, um, cause we're, you know, we're, we're going through a lot and, uh, and it's good for us to go through suffering and pain, uh, because it makes us realize the one thing that we need and that's God. Yeah. Uh, and I, a lot of times for Americans, this is really hard for us to understand because we live in, in, in the deity of self. You that's know? a good, uh, that's uh, yeah. Yeah. The deity do. of self. And so you we ha- exalt me. Yeah. And so, yeah, we have, we have to, in order to acquire the living rivers of living water. Yeah. You have to acquire the ascetical life. You have to acquire if you want to, to acquire a relationship that is so deep that words cannot ex- ex- explain um, a relationship with God that changes you. Yeah. That's light transforming. I mean, you become even more radiant. Yeah. That's why when people say something to you like, oh, there's something different about you. Well, yeah, because you're shining to them and a sea of complete darkness. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, um, I think it's very difficult for us. We want uh, we want Jesus to be the Jesus that is comfortable for us, and uh, Jesus was not. He showed in his life he wasn't here to make anybody comfortable. And the Holy Spirit, uh, Father, in, in in Pentecost, we're getting down to where we should tie back into Pentecost. What do you want to uh, go to from here? Well, this feeds all into Pentecost. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Pentecost now is the fulfillment and completion of everything that's happened now. It is the completion of everything. And um, the apostles didn't get it until now. Mm -hmm. They were journeying with our Lord. Yeah, they They, went on fire. They saw miracles. They performed miracles. They uh, were witnesses. But at the same time, they fled away. But 
they did something that many of us need to do, and that's repent. And it starts with a heart that needs to be softened, right? They're waiting in the upper room, right? The, the ascension happened mm-hmm. 10 days later, Pentecost happens. They were sitting in the upper room and then the Holy Spirit descends upon them like fiery tongues. Yeah. And what's the closest thing to, to, to a tongue? Word, words. And then what do they go out and do? They go proclaim in all different types of languages. No education, these guys. 3,000 are baptized on the first day of Pentecost. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in order for us to acquire this living water, right, the Spirit, which comes through the Holy Spirit, comes through the Holy Spirit, we have to understand that, comes through the Holy Spirit through the rivers of the living water, it starts with the destruction of the self-will, yeah. of the selfishness. Yeah, selfishness, self-centeredness. And, and you're only going to acquire that through the ascetical life. Love for God and the ascetical life. Yeah. Stuffing yeah. your face over and over and over again, you're not going to get very good at prostitution. Does anybody think the apostles didn't pray and fast? They're fasting and praying all the time. We hear that in Acts. Or you hear about that St. Paul when he's constantly talking about, I have fasted for you and so on and so forth. So uh, the ascetical life is um, a huge portion of living a Christian life. And for those out there who this is all new to, understand something. This is not by any power of their own. The saints who act, who are, are, are the church, which is no longer on the earth, okay? The saints who act for us when we intercede for them, it's not by their power that these things happen, but by the power of God that comes through them as they was for them on the earth, where it was not by any power of their own that they healed or raised the dead, yeah. but by the power of God that came through them because they died to themselves. And, well, Father, I, I'd never seen or heard, did they attain theosis? The saints? Yes. Of course they did. On the earth. Yes. Yeah. Well, you said something, you said the church is not on the earth. I want to... No, no, the church which is not on the earth. I'm talking about the saints the who triumphant. intercede for the us. The church yes. triumphant. Yeah. You have to understand. I mean, yeah. I, this will tie in, too, with what we're talking about with talking to the saints. You know, text the saint. Uh, you know, there's the church triumphant and the church militant. You know, those who are on earth are the church militant. And those who are in in paradise are the church, church triumphant. Triumphant. Still there is, living. There is no, yeah, there's no separation. It's one church. It's one body. One body of Christ. Mm-hmm. It's not two different bodies. No. It's one body. The church militant is in communion with the church triumphant. Mm -hmm. This is why when we serve the divine liturgy, we are with the saints and angels. As soon as the priest says, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into ages of ages, amen, the saints and the angels are with us. You know, Father, people sometimes find it strange, so they'll say, why do you go to church? I said, because I want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is already here, but not fully. Yeah, we're waiting for the resurrection. Yeah. And... And I think it's strange for them. And and that's okay. That's okay. I hope it's strange enough that they want to inquire more. Well, of course it's strange because yeah. it's otherworldly. Yeah. It's not of it's not of earthly. It's it's heavenly. Yeah, we don't walk around uh, not touching the floor, folks. That's not, you know, how this well, the works. The floor even becomes sanctified. Yeah, that's true. The floor even All I mean, everything become becomes sanctified. sanctified. Your home. Everything. When when you are involved in a life with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you cannot comfortably, you cannot comfortably continue in your sins. Yeah, and when you do sin, you feel the pain of it. Yes, you are confronted every step of the way with that relationship and how you work against it. Well, and you're also confronted, not that anybody's confronting you, you feel you feel the rejection. No, I'm not going to use that word. You feel the separation. That's, yeah. You That's feel better, right? the separation yeah. from the love of God. Not that he does not love you. Nope. I'm talking about the separation of where you have separated yourself That's right. from him. And yeah, I guess it is a type of rejection. The because, turning away. Because you're rejecting him. Yeah, it's part of turning away. Yeah. It's a different word. We have a we have about five minutes, folks. Yeah. I hope this has made sense. I mean, it, it's all tying in with Pentecost, the ascetical life, um, uh, praying fervently and uh, with an honest and sincere and humble heart. Uh, I encourage people that you know come to Holy Orthodoxy. You can always send me to uh, more questions. My email is uh, 
F R C O L I N B at gmail.com. I'll take your questions and always God willing show you closer. Text mm-hmm. George those prayers if you want to yeah. receive those if you prayers. Forget for the hours. His email three three oh two oh seven. Yeah. 3672 and I'll text you back his email yeah. if that's what you want. Yep, that they could do that too. Um but you know, a lot of this time, a lot of this this this, this can kind of be upfronting and kind of you know, this is confusing, sure. strange. Uh I really kind of overwhelmed, right? You're overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, those are all good things. Um, breathe, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Show me to do your will a- and pause and be patient. Uh, and our Lord will work through you if you are willing uh, to acquire the Holy Spirit. But that's only coming through Holy Orthodoxy. Well, we're not here, Father, if you will affirm. We are not here and are not permitted to judge the souls of others. No, They're and I have no desire to. Yeah, and we are here to speak the truth. We're here to speak the truth in love, and in so doing, the truth unveils error. Yeah. And there is no joy in telling somebody how erroneous they are uh, in beating them over the head, so to speak, with orthodoxy. Yeah. There is a joy in unveiling error when the person who is in living in error realizes that that, in fact, is not the wholeness and fullness of the truth, yeah. though it may be somewhat true, and, and then moves forward, whether they come fully into orthodoxy at that time or whether they begin to inquire, that's where the joy is in that uh, they, too, will begin this walk, which is totally not about building you up in pride, let me tell you what. Well, and also truth and love is fire. Think about that. Truth yeah. and love is fire. It consumes uh, and, and devours. That's right. And fire doesn't devour because it hates or it is prideful. It devours because that which it meets is not fire. Yeah. And it purifies yes. it. I mean, yes. you look at wildfires, right? You know, like especially... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in the Northwest where it's full of pine trees and everything, mm-hmm. they always have fires. But they always talk about the years after the fires and how actually the land becomes much more yeah. fertile. Fruitful, yeah. Fruitful, thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're called to do. We're called to bear fruit. And I think we're going to end right now. So tonight we have Vespers at 4 p.m. Uh, yes. And we begin our come, journey. Oh, geez, we, please we begin come. our journey to Pentecost. Um, uh, St. Mark's. St. Mark's at 3560 Logan Way in Youngstown, Ohio. God bless you. I pray that you all have a fruitful journey in your own life. Uh, And may our Lord have mercy on us and remember us in his heavenly kingdom. Amen. O heavenly King, the comforter, the spirit of truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, the treasure of good things and the giver of life, come and dwell on us, cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good good one. God bless you and a blessed feast of Holy Pentecost. You have been listening to On Earth As In Heaven, brought to you by the Eastern Orthodox Church Association and the blessed sacrifices of lay people who donate to this mission. If you would like to attend an Orthodox liturgical service, you can locate a temple near you through the Yellow Pages or via the Internet. Thank you for tuning in to On Earth As In Heaven. And until next time, we pray God's blessings on each of you.